Remember, a Hallmark card when you care enough to send the very best. From Hollywood, the makers of Hallmark cards bring you a true story from the life of Wyatt Earp on the Hallmark Hall of Fame. And here is our distinguished host, Edward Arnold. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to the Hallmark Hall of Fame. Tonight, our true story is transcribed from the life of one of America's most fabulous and courageous law enforcement officers, the famous marshal and sheriff of the early West, Wyatt Earp. Now, Wyatt Earp was more than a Western gunslinger, more than a fast man on the draw. He was directly responsible, perhaps more than any other person, for bringing law and order to the West. And our story tonight will tell you how it all began. Now, here is Frank Goss. As the Christmas season approaches, one of the most enjoyable prospects is the sending of Hallmark Christmas cards to be chosen with pleasure and mailed with pride. For in Hallmark cards of any price, you'll find the inherent quality and craftsmanship you want in your personal greeting to your friends. And the familiar hallmark and crown on the back of the card shows, too, that you care enough to send the very best. And now Mr. Arnold brings you our true story from the life of Wyatt Earp on the Hallmark Hall of Fame. Wyatt Earp was born on March the 19th, 1848, at Monmouth, Illinois. In 1864, his family migrated further west, and young Wyatt became first a stagecoach driver, then part owner of a wagon freight line, next a guide for a government surveying party, and finally, in the early 1870s, a successful buffalo hunter. One evening in the spring of 1873, Wyatt and his partner, Brad Evans, returned to their camp where they pegged out the skins from the day's kill to dry. Big fellow, wasn't he? Yeah. yeah. Skin like this might bring five dollars. Too bad we ain't got more like him. Oh, uh, we've done all right, Brad. Oh, sure we have. Well, right, sure we have. Not as good as last year, though. I've been doing some figuring. We're averaging about four animals a day less this go-round. Uh-huh. Of course, next year will probably be better. I expect there's ups and downs in buffalo killing like everything else. Uh, there won't be any next year, Brad. Leastways, not for me. Huh? Other herds are thinning out, and they're a lot harder to find, too. Next fall, most of the hunters will lose money. After that, well, it won't be very long before the animals are as scarce as hen's teeth. Oh, there'll always be buffalo wide. Why, we've seen them to the thousands. They couldn't just be wiped off the face of the earth no matter what. Uh, maybe not, Brad. Maybe not. That, that's how I see it. Well, if you ain't gonna hunt buffalo, what are you gonna do? Uh, I don't know. Uh, now you're not gonna do nothing foolish like get yourself married and start raising a family. I've been married. What? Oh, we weren't together very long. There was a... a typhus epidemic. I... I'm sorry, Wyatt. I, I just... Never thought that... Oh, you don't seem like the marrying type to me. I'm not. Not now, anyhow. You ever think of going back to stage driving or hauling freight? Oh, that was all right when I was a kid before the railroads came through. Now, by the time we sell these skins, I'm going to be worth a couple of thousand dollars. Now, there's lots of money being made in cattle these days folks driving their herds up from Texas. Uh, well, you just take my advice and stay away from them Kansas cattle towns, wife. Now, what do you mean? You get mixed up with them cowboys and them wide-open birds, and the first thing you know, you'll be using that six-gun of yours. Oh, I'm not denying that you're mighty handy with it. 
But you ain't got the temperament to be a gunfighter. Sir. Now, Brad, I got no intention of being a gunfighter. Well, you get to hanging out where they hang out, and it'll rub off. Sure as fate, it'll rub off on you. Yeah, man's got to do something. He's got to go somewhere. He don't have to go to them Kansas cattle towns. <laughs> All right, Brad. Since you're so concerned, when I go east, I won't wear my guns. That ought to cut down my chances of getting into trouble. Yeah, you'll put them on fast enough. Mark my word, Wyatt, you'll put them on. A short time later, Wyatt Earp drifted into the town of Ellsworth, Kansas. At the time, Ellsworth was one of the northern shipping centers for the Texas cattle herds and over 150,000 head grazed on nearby prairies while awaiting shipment further east. With the cattle were a thousand impatient, swaggering, gun-belted cowboys. On the afternoon of August 18th, as Wyatt slowly crossed the plaza, he was met by Ben Thompson, one of the leaders of the Texas contingent. Ben carried a loaded shotgun, and with him were some 10 or 12 cowmen. Hey, hold on there. Where do you think you're going? Uh, anywhere I'm a mind to. Yeah? Well, it just might be we've got a mind to tell you. Hey, it's Wyatt, ain't it? Wyatt Earp? That's right. Hello, Ben. Yeah. What you doing around here? I'll just pass him through. Hmm. You know him, Ben? Yeah. Yeah, he's a friend of mine. Uh -huh. Well, go ahead, Wyatt. Go on about your business. It's all right with me. I, uh, didn't ask you whether it was all right or not, Ben. I don't know any reason why I should. <laughs> ah, howdy. Store's closed for the day, mister. Better come back tomorrow. That's pretty early to be closing up, isn't it? Well, it's my business, ain't it? Oh, sure. Uh, you mind telling me what's going on out there? Why didn't you ask your friend, Ben Thompson? Well, I met up with Ben here and there, played cards with him, but uh, that doesn't make him my friend. He said you was. I heard him say so. Well, you didn't hear me say so. You mean you, you ain't from Texas? California. Well, I might have figured you wasn't no cowboy, seeing as how you was bare-hipped. Sure do apologize for the mistake, Mr. Uh, uh, Earp. Wyatt Earp. Oh, my name's B.B. Ben shot the sheriff? No, it was Ben's kid brother, Bill. There was an argument over at Brennan's saloon. The Thompsons and a fellow they were playing poker with. Sheriff Whitney tried to quiet him, and Bill Thompson cut him down point blank. I ain't heard yet. Where, Where did Bill go? Oh, he hightailed it out of town. Ben took his shotgun to cover him, and he's been standing out there ever since, daring somebody to go after Bill. Well, them fellas out there, they're just looking for an excuse to tree Ellsworth the way they've treed all the other cow towns. I never should have put in that plate glass. I noted it when I ordered it. Uh -huh. Well, uh, I guess I'll be moving on. Oh, uh, you uh, got any uh, special place to go, son? No. No special place. Well, if uh, you'd like to earn a little change, you can give me a hand here. I'm making up some burying boxes. I'll pay you two bits a box. Well, that sounds like a fair price. How many you want? As many as you can make till this pile of lumber gives out anyway. Uh, we'll need them before the day's out. I tell you, we'll need them. bring you the second act of the Hallmark Hall of Fame. As you know, Hallmark has always offered a beautiful array of religious Christmas cards, and this year the collection is larger than ever, as you will see when you visit one of the fine stores that features Hallmark cards. Seeing this collection is almost like visiting a gallery of religious art. 
There are Hallmark Christmas cards which reproduce world-famous religious paintings, and there are cards designed by modern-day artists who treat the subject of the first Christmas with a freshness and simplicity that's inspiring. The messages, too, reflect this mood of reverence. There are Hallmark cards with a Christmas prayer inside, and a whole series that feature the stirring words of Dr. Norman Vincent Peale. Dr. Peel has written these beautiful and inspiring Christmas messages exclusively for Hallmark cards. And you'll find his moving words on each of the 12 Christmas cards contained in the Hallmark Dr. Peel box, as well as on individual Hallmark Christmas cards. And remember, as always, it's Hallmark cards when you care enough to send the very best. And now Edward Arnold brings you the second act of our true story from the life of Wyatt Earp. <laughs> Next half hour, Ben Thompson roved up and down the plaza, shouting threats and defying the decent citizens of Ellsworth. No one had yet attempted to disarm him and his cowboy allies. Hey, uh, what are you waiting for? Come on out and open somebody. Give us a little target practice. <laughs> Inside the store, Wyatt Earp and George Beebe were joined by Mayor Jim Miller and Deputy Marshal Happy Jack Marco, a hired Indian fighter and a six-gun expert. I'm not going to put up with this nonsense any longer, Jack. Now, you go out there and you lay down the law. Why, they'd shoot me down before I got my mouth open. A man would be plumb loco to set a foot outside that door. I walked past Thompson a little while ago. He didn't bother me. Well, you ain't a deputy marshal. Now, that's true. I'm not. Jack, I'm tired of arguing with you. And I'm tired of listening. Do you want to arrest Ben Thompson? Arrest him yourself. All right. Guess I'll have to. There just don't seem to be anybody else to do it. Uh, uh, don't stand in front of the window, Jim. <laughs> Uh, Ben? Well, this is the mayor. Howdy, mayor. <laughs> ben, now, I, I'm uh, ordering you to lay down that gun. <laughs> ben, I, I'm, I'm ordering you now to submit to arrest. Oh, yeah, yeah. Oh, he wants me to hear that. He wants me to submit to arrest. Now, Get away from the window, Jim. Mr. Mayor! Here's what we think of your order. Look out for the plate glass! Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> hey, come on, oh, I asked you to get away from my window. Will you stop yammering about that, George? He could have killed me just then. If he'd have wanted to. You do a lot of talking, mister. Well, that's about all anybody's doing, isn't it? Who are you, anyway? Just a bystander. My name's Wyatt Earp. Never heard of you. But he knows Ben Thompson. Stood up to him, too. Just before you got here, Jim, stood up to him right out there in the street, just as big as life. Is that so? I guess he wasn't taking much of a risk, seeing as how he ain't wearing a gun. Well, I don't see where your gun's been much help, Jack. Now, just give them cowboys a few hours to get some of the devilment out of their bones, and by morning, everything will be peaceful again. Maybe. But that won't stop them from killing your next sheriff any time they got a mind to. How, uh, would you go about stopping him, Herb? I'd arrest him. Or I'd kill him. Okay. Go ahead. What do you think you're pulling, Jim? He ain't got the right to arrest nobody. I'm the deputy marshal. Oh, you're fired, Marco. Give me what? your badge. Uh, hand it over. Well, all right, Jim. But who's going to wear it after Herb gets himself killed? That ain't your worry. Well, I'll be around back when you want me. All right, Mr. Herb. Here's your badge. You are the marshal now. And I'm ordering you to arrest Ben Thompson. George, fix him up with some guns. Right over here, son. Yeah, I'll take your pick. That there pair in front of brand new is supposed to be the finest set ever to come this way. You, uh, uh, got 
got any second-hand 45s? Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. This, uh, this pair here, but, uh... The trigger dog's been filed on them. I ain't certain about that. Just a second. Well, it seems as though they have. Sure do work smooth. Uh, can, can I try them? Oh, sure. Uh-huh. Yeah, yeah, they'll do. All right, here's some cartridges. Oh, thank you. Uh, I'll need a belt, too. Oh, sure, sure. I don't know what I was thinking about. Yeah. Well, this one may be a mite large. Yeah. No, that that's fine. <laughs> you must be something bigger than you look. Well, son. You all set? Yeah. Uh, where do you want me to bring him? Hmm? Thompson, where where do you want him? Oh. Well, I I guess Judge Osborne's court, that's right around the corner. Yeah, you better bring him there if you arrest him. Okay. Uh, here. Yeah. Good luck. Thank you. Oh, uh, wait a minute, John. What? Huh? You ain't going out there that way with your guns in them holsters. Oh, well, that's where I usually wear my guns. Take a little company with me. You, Ben, I'd take you along. You too, Cat. I, I figure on including you. Come on, Ben. We'll back you up. Yo, mighty eager. Ain't you seen the police standing out here in front of you? Shut up. All right, Herb. Make your play. I got no play to make. I'm just putting you under arrest. Go on, I tell you. Go for your guns. I'll go for them when I need them. Now, either you use that shotgun or you throw it down. Throw it down, Patton. Yes, I do. The fellas over there in the store have cut me down. If they try that, they'll have to shoot it out with me first. Now, drop it. Okay, why it's your call in the turn. Arresta, you stay out of this. Now, I want your six guns, too, Ben. Why, sure. Yeah. Thank you. All right, the judge is waiting. Let's go. Judge, 
Don't try it, Chad. Now, listen. Ben's going to stay in jail until he's had a trial. Anybody who doesn't like the idea is welcome to join him. A trial or a lynch? Yeah! I said a trial. Now, you're making too much noise, so start moving. I said start moving. Come on, now, wait a minute. Very well. Now that some dignity has been restored, we can proceed. Uh, what's the charges? All right, speak up. What's the charges? Well, Your Honor, I, uh... I guess taking part in a murder, uh, I guess that's the charge. Hmm. Accessory to homicide. Is that what you mean, Mr. Earp? Uh, well, yes, sir. All right, now, who are the witnesses? Come, come now, the witnesses. Did anybody see this crime? No, I don't know. Well, Mr. Earp, did you see it? Uh... No, sir, I didn't see it, but I was told... What you were told is not evidence, Mr. Earp. Uh, Your Honor? Uh, yes, Mr. Mayor? Uh, I think, uh, under the circumstances, well, since it was Ben's brother who did the actual shooting, I, I think the charges ought to be, say, uh, disturbing the peace. Very well, Mayor Miller. Charge of accessory to a homicide is dismissed. The accused is found guilty of disturbing the peace and is hereby fined $25. Well, uh, what about my window? And is ordered to pay Mr. Beebe the cost of one plate glass window. Uh, <clears throat> the court's adjourned. <laughs> is that all? Well, well, then, here's your $25, Jen. I'll, uh, I'll take care of it, Mr. Thompson. Why, sure. Now, say, what about my guns? Don't I get them back? Yes, certainly. The marshal will return them to you. Oh. What? Well, yes, that's the lawyer. When a man's paid his fine, he gets his property back. Oh. All right, Ben. Thanks, what? Oh, uh, just a minute, Ben. Yeah. Don't put them on in here. Law or no law, don't put them on until you're out of my sight. Why, sure. You know, uh, I'm sorry you had so much trouble, Herb. For $25, it don't hardly seem worth it. Well, I won't be needing this badge any longer. Oh, now, now, hold on, Herb. You mustn't think we don't appreciate what you've done, but... After all, he really wasn't guilty of murder. Sure. One thing, though, you really proved yourself. We, uh, all want you to stay on here as marshal. Permanent. <laughs> that's right, Herb. Yep, you're our man. Well, that's mighty kind of you, gentlemen. As a matter of fact, this business today has sort of decided things for me. Up until now, I didn't know just what I wanted to do for a living, but, uh... Well, now I sort of think I might like the idea of being a lawman. A friend of mine told me I'd be putting on my guns. But I don't think he'd mind this way. Well, everything's going to work out fine. The only thing is, I, uh... I wouldn't care to enforce the law here in Ellsworth. Why? Huh? I don't understand. We'll pay you $100 a month. Well, the salary's all right for a live sheriff, but, uh... You folks seem to figure a dead sheriff's only worth $25. Nah, I, I figure different. And I guess maybe I can find other towns that agree with me. So long. And so Wyatt Earp refused the job of Marshal of Ellsworth. But he had chosen his career, and he soon found law enforcement jobs he was willing to accept. Deputy Marshal of Wichita, Kansas, Marshal of Dodge City, Deputy Sheriff of Tombstone, and Deputy United States Marshal. 
No sheriff of the year has so successfully brought law and order to the towns and states he served. Long after the notorious outlaws he had outshot or outwitted were forgotten, Wyatt Earp, at the age of 81, died peacefully in his home. But he had left behind a clear road for America, a trail leading west. Turn in just a moment. One of the wonderful things about the Christmas season is that it's a time of expressing good wishes to all our friends. But there are so many people you like to greet that you may be wondering how you can remember them all and yet stay within your Christmas budget. Well, Hallmark Cards has the answer for you. For even though Hallmark Cards are always recognized for their high quality, that doesn't mean they need to be expensive. In fact, there's a very attractive selection of Hallmark Cards in boxes where even the title on the box tells you what a bargain they are, like the Hallmark Big Value Box and the Hallmark Thrifty Box. These contain 25 different Hallmark cards and cost only $1 a box. There are also others which have 25 Christmas cards, all with the same design, and they too are only $1 for the box of 25. So you see, by sending Hallmark cards, it's really easy to give all your friends the compliment of showing you care enough to send the very best. Now, here is Edward Arnold. Yes, Frank, those Hallmark box selections and all the other Hallmark Christmas cards surely do make it easy for everyone to send greetings to all of their friends at this season of the year. Well, tonight we told a dramatic moment in the history of the Old West. Incidentally, Wyatt Earp was played by William Conrad, who stars in the famous radio series Gunsmoke as Matt Dillon. Next week, we travel to England and to the 18th century on the Hallmark Hall of Fame. It'll be a true story from the life of one of England's greatest actresses, Sarah Siddons. And our star will be the charming and brilliant Miss Helen Hayes. And the following week is another special event, I believe. That's right, Frank. On December 19th, we will be proud to bring, just as he performed it on the Hallmark Hall of Fame, Lionel Barrymore in his famous portrayal of Scrooge in Charles Dickens' Christmas Carol. We are indeed honored to help continue this beloved Christmas tradition. This is Edward Arnold saying good night until next week. Won't you join us then? Hallmark cards that are sold only in stores that have been carefully selected to give you expert and friendly service. Remember, a Hallmark card when you care enough to send the very best. The Hallmark Hall of Fame is produced and directed by William Prude. Tonight's transcribed script by Frank Burt. Included in our cast were Polly Bear, Herb Vigran, Lawrence Dobkin, Harry Bartell, Joseph Kearns, Paul Dubov, and Paul Fried. William Conrad is heard every Saturday on Gunsmoke over CBS Radio. Brought to you by L&M Filter Cigarettes. This is Frank Goss saying goodnight to you until next week at the same time when you'll hear a true story from the life of Sarah Siddons starring Miss Helen Hayes on the Hallmark Hall of Fame. This is the CBS Radio Network.